Hey everyone, you're listening to Film Philosophy, where we break down the philosophies, concepts, and structures of filmmaking in the American film industry. We are filmmakers Tiffany Francis, Andrew Coles, and Nzinga Murray. Film Philosophy is brought to you by The Mission Entertainment. Today's episode features Calvin Yu, and the topic that we are tackling is internal obstacles. Kelvin Yu is an actor, writer, and showrunner who has an incredible credits list. I'll try my best to distill what I can because he has so many credits. I can't even get to the nitty gritty of it. But as an actor, he's had roles in shows like ER, Bones, Master of None, The After Party. You've seen him in movies like Cloverfield, Milk, Wonder Woman, 1984. As a writer and executive producer, he's worked on Bob's Burgers and has won an Emmy for his work there and is most recently known for being the executive producer and showrunner of the Disney Plus show American Born Chinese. There is a lot I missed, but his credits alone would take up the whole hour, so I will spare all of you guys right now. Uh, We chose Kelvin for this topic of internal obstacles because I was once very blessed to have a great conversation with him about what minorities and Asian Americans and underrepresented people in our industry have to face. And he brought up how internal struggles are different from the external ones. Um, in general, I just find Kelvin to be a really thoughtful creator. And with his decades worth of experience, I felt like he would have a lot to say on this topic. So, and actually, I remember when I listened to him talk about this, conversations like this are really why I created this podcast in the first place. I feel like So many people would have a lot to benefit from what he has to say. So without further ado, here is Kelvin. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Kelvin, let's talk about the internal obstacles of minorities. Can you first tell us what you consider to be internal versus external obstacles and maybe, you know, something that you've personally experienced? And do you have any stories about like what this means as an underrepresented creative? Yeah, I mean, I obviously will just speak to my own experience. I don't think that there's a monolithic experience for, you know, minorities across the board, um, ethnically or, you know, within sexual orientation or gender or anything like that. But obviously, if you're living in a society where you're not seeing uh, representations of yourself, and if that, if any positive representations of yourself, um, you know, feeding back at you all day, there's going to be um, some kind of inner dissonance about whether or not you belong up there or whether or not you belong in the room, so to speak. Um, so I know for myself, I, I think the, the dragon, the dragon to slay has been an internal one as opposed to, you know, growing up in extreme poverty or growing up with an extreme abuse or anything like that. So it's been a question of confidence, a question of belonging. And, um, But I do think on some level that the nation is having this conversation. Um, Mm. I think that for the last, maybe since like Obama, and and you might dovetail that with just the internet in general and social media, that the country is having a conversation about entitlement, period. Like Mm -hmm. good entitlement, bad entitlement, and how a new technology like the internet and, and social media can redefine or reframe what is healthy entitlement and what is toxic entitlement. Um, And so we're having that conversation, you know, under an Obama administration and then again under a Trump administration and now in in different ways under a Biden administration. And so I think, I mean, not to digress and suddenly talk about the presidency, but like, I think think that at the core of what we're talking about is a conversation about entitlement. And am I entitled to anything? Or am Mm -hmm. I entitled... um, to, to nothing, you know, and, and um, so for me, that's always been the dragon is is my sense of of belonging. I think you're empowered by, um, you know, I have a three and a half year old. He's in preschool. They don't allow them to wear superhero T-shirts or superhero oh, really? outfits. Yeah. Interesting. And it, it feels a little sort of draconian in a way, but it's also like a good point. <laughs> like if you've ever seen a kid put on a Superman cape or, a you know, walk around with a Thor hammer um, mm. it and, you know, think about that. Think about what's happening there. They're they're embodying um, an icon or they're embodying iconography and it's mm. changing their identity. It's changing their wow. behavior. It's changing their self view, their world view. 
So imagine if for your whole life, you, you never see a character on screen that looks like you in a positive, healthy way. Um, or imagine that you sort of look like Peter Parker, or you sort of look, you have the same color hair as Thor, or this, mm. you know, or your mom kind of resembles Wonder Woman or something, you know, like mm -hmm. it, cha it changes you, you know, it changes. We're talking about representation. We're talking about empowerment. And so, um, you know, that alone is a visceral lesson in terms of why one might question their belonging, you know, because you on a, on some like sort of lizard brain pre-linguistic level, you haven't seen yourself up on that 40 foot screen or up on that billboard. And so um, that's sort of like the most intellectual way I can put it, the real sort of human, you know, emotional way, which my therapist would recommend I stay in, um, <laughs> is that, you know, you just, you, for so long, you're sort of like begging for scraps. You know, you're just hoping to get in the door. You're hoping to have a job. Um, I think that what's interesting about this Nepo baby discourse, for instance, is that yeah, everybody's I was talking ask you about, about that, actually. <laughs> everybody's talking about the um, tangible, professional um, benefits of being the son or daughter of somebody famous. But actually, I think that much, much, much more um, powerful is the psychological benefits. Like, you know what I mean? People don't yeah. actually mm -hmm. go and hire somebody because their dad was like a junior agent at CAA or something like that. Like, that's not really, or right. even if their dad was Kirk Douglas, it's, it, it's not, that's not really what's going on. What I think what really is happening, at least in my empirical experience, is that when I've been around, we all have somebody who's the child of a, of a successful artist or entertainer, they don't have that internal dragon. They have seen a parent succeed in pop music, in cinema, in television production, in, you know, like they have seen that. Mm -hmm. And so they do not doubt that that's a possibility for their life. And that seems like such a leg up. That seems like such, yeah. that, totally. that to me is being born, being born on a psychological third base, I think is much preferred to being born on a financial third base. Um, mm -hmm. And because, you know, you can just hit the gas, not to mention you're around and your uncles or your or your godfather, godmother, family, friends will probably be in the industry, too. So it's not just a parent. You're what, you know, um, you know, Mrs. Johnson, who your mom has lunch with sometime, is also a director, is also and so is also a screenwriter. And so you it's normalized the the life of a of an artist is normalized. And that to me mm -hmm. seems like the thing that I. I actually covet more than, oh, I wish my dad was a studio head in the 80s or something. That, That's not really preferable. Totally. That can almost be a stigma. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, But the psychological liberation of that. I don't know. I yeah. don't know if I'm answering any of your questions. No. You're totally answering. You are, you, are, you are hitting it. And I think one of the things that's really fascinating is, you know, just the distinction that you've made of the psychological benefits of, you know, seeing a direct family member, you know, who has found success in this medium. But also then, you know, if it is not someone that you are related to, someone who you can envision yourself as, someone who you could imagine yourself being related to. And I think those distinctions, as you just said, the inner dissonance of do I actually belong here? Is there space for me? Mm -hmm. Do people like me belong in this conversation? Do people belong like me belong in these roles? Um, it's mm -hmm. such a powerful thing that begins so early for us. So the question that I have for you is, are there moments that you remember from growing up where you felt that distance or were there moments where you felt like, oh, there is an entry point? Like, how did you begin your journey of overcoming, you know, what I imagine was um, not often seeing yourself reflect or not seeing, often seeing yourself in these, in these mm -hmm. positions? Mm -hmm. At the risk of, you know, just talking about myself for an hour, like my sort of rosebud moment was um, a teacher tapping me on the shoulder, you know, and... and and so I, I take it very seriously. I take people in those mentor positions very seriously. A moment, we all have them, if you just think about it enough. Um, mm -hmm. A moment or two can completely alter your, the course of your life. And particularly a moment from an adult when you're a young person um, can damage you, um, can, you know, mm -hmm. can, can empower you, can uplift you. And for no reason, uh, a teacher tapped me on the shoulder and asked, and during lunch and said, I think you should audition for the school play. 
it's not like it was some big epiphany, um, but it did feel aligning. It felt like she's right, and I'll go to that meeting, you know, after school on Friday or wow. whatever um, at at three thirty. And so I went, and then what happened was the school play was Pippin, and the main one of the main characters, the narrator, who is like kind of the main character, it was it's, it was a they were showing a VCR on a VCR a taped stage capture of the nineteen seventy nine version of Pippin, and the actor on screen when I walked in was Ben Vereen, so it was a black actor in the nineteen seventies with no set, and he was singing a number called Glory, which has no set, so it's just Ben Vereen on stage killing it and he's he's an incredible performer he's a vision but and i have actually considered what would have happened if when i walked in the room there was a white actor on stage because mm. i do remember thinking oh maybe maybe there's a role for me in this you know what i mean because the the char- because i just happened to walk in when ben vereen was on stage and not when william cat was on stage who was the other lead actor i might have possibly thought i don't know if there's anything in this for me, but because he Mm -hmm. was the lead and because that was who I saw. um, And so I think those kinds of um, like little opportunistic, you know, cracks in like they, they, for those of us who dared dream of entering, you were searching for them at an earlier age. You're like, well, where would I fit in in this world? Where, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I sort of forgot the question, but that was my, that was, that was how I um, allowed myself to imagine any level of entitlement. Like, and so mm-hmm. you think about, um, I, I had a meeting with a, a young writer not too long ago from India, and she's mm-hmm. just moved here within the last two or three years. And she said, it was Mindy Kaling. Of course it was Mindy Kaling. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah. she, she was like, that's what that's what made me think I could move to the United States to go to college and start writing half hour television comedy from Mumbai wow. as Mindy Kaling. Wow. And so these kinds of things, they have sort of untold ripple effects. You know, they're the, that pebble, the proverbial pebble that just, you know, keeps going and going, and going. So I think there's real power in all that. And, and then you get to the, you get to the, and at every point, you're uncomfortable because at first you're uncomfortable just to be in the room, but then you're like, I'm in the room. I feel I'm getting more comfortable. And then they ask Mm -hmm. you to do something a little bit more than get coffee or so to speak. Um, And at each level you, you have to, you have to slay that dragon over and over and over again. It seems. Um, I mean, the last thing I'll throw in is that I think everybody needs to start from where they're at. So Mm -hmm. like, I think there's a a comedians in cars um, getting coffee with Kevin Hart and, He's talking to Seinfeld and they they put it really well. Like there's, they represent two kinds of comedy. I forget exactly what it's something like Kevin Hart is things are bad. How do I make myself feel good? And Jerry Seinfeld is things are good. Why do I feel so bad? <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and both of them are legitimate comedy. I mean, I, I go to, I like both kinds of comedy. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's very reductive, but they were just talking about the two completely different angles that they come at. To, to wind up standing on a stage with a microphone making people laugh. And they're very yeah. different. They're very, very different and yet completely legitimate because they're authentic because that's where Kevin Hart is coming from and that's where Jerry Seinfeld is coming from. And so, you know, as, a, as an Asian American actor and writer and producer, I just have to be authentic about where I'm coming from um, and tell that story because at the end of the day, I think people will sniff you out, even if you're an expert at, at uh, hiding the authenticity. Eventually, it sort of doesn't work. Which, totally. It, it's such, and it's such a, I, I find that, that point that you've just made about, you know, being very good at hiding the authenticity. Because I think for mm-hmm. those of us, you know, who grew up in predominantly white environments, who went to predominantly white institutions, you know, I felt so much pressure, you know, being, you know, a black American in those early years, in those formative years to assimilate, to say, hey, sure. it is my differences that are singling me out. You know, what if I sand some of those down? What if I move closer to the middle? What if I listen to the same music that my classmates are listening to? What if I dress in the same ways? What if I talk in the same ways? And so in a lot of ways, I think there has been an unlearning for me of, oh, that 
if if you continue down that path, you will never be able to show up authentically. And mm-hmm. it's it's hard because it's that pressure of middle school and high school where I want to fit in. I want to feel like I belong. I don't want people to single me out. I don't want to be, you know, the black kid in the group. I just want to be a kid. I just want to be like everyone else. But I think, you know, in, in the importance of, you know, us as artists, I think in honing in on our authenticity, shining that forth and the understanding that if we show up authentically, we could be that example that Ben Vereen was for you. Mm-hmm. The permissibility mm-hmm. of others that you don't have to hide yourself, that you don't have to sand those edges down. Those edges are actually what make you most interesting. Those edges are what allow you to bring something to the conversation that many other people can't bring. Um so I think just that, percent. yeah, that, that distinction mm-hmm. of how do we show up authentically in these spaces that, you know, have oftentimes we've been taught, don't be yourself. People mm-hmm. like you mm-hmm. don't make it here. Or, you know, what I like to call the Highlander mentality. It's like, there can be only one. It's like, we're going to, we already, we already have the Asian show. We've already got that black thing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, are there, as over the course of your career and sort of in the different roles that you have played, you know, have you seen a shift, you know, you marked sort of the political shifts in the country and sort of this crisis of conscience that we're having as a country. Have you felt some of those shifts in how you approach your work and how your work has been received? Sure. I mean, the, the, the sort of hierarchy um, of television writing is actually really... Um, old school in a way and militaristic not and i don't mean that in a pejorative sense like but you know you come in as a staff writer then you move up to story editor then you executive story editor then your producer supervising producer co-producer like you literally there's literally titles at every stage because i was on a series bob's burgers for over a decade every year i moved up generally speaking that doesn't happen people kind of stall at one show and then the show gets canceled and then they move to the next show but they didn't jump yet and then it takes time to get up and up but the, when you're on a series for 13 seasons you just move up the ranks and so in a pretty quick clip I got to experience all the different angles of that and um, I have to say I think and I'll stereotype myself as an Asian American sort of honor student I was a pretty good staff writer you know what I mean? Like your job is your job is to make one person laugh. Like you're you're I mean, you're writing for America, you're writing for your staff, you're writing for, you know, the producers in the studio. But really, you're walking into the room to the other staff writers, you're like, what'd he say? Yeah, he liked it. What'd he say? Yeah, he didn't he didn't really laugh. Yeah. I mean, you're your day in, day out existence <laughs> as a staff writer. And I'm not saying this in a bad way. And thank God Lauren Bouchard is also like the funniest, most talented guy I've ever met. But I mean, I could imagine the hell it would be to try to make a guy laugh who's not funny <laughs> would, right, or who right. has bad have taste. have a sense of humor. <laughs> right, right. Who has a terrible sense of, you know, if, if your North Star is South, that would suck, right? But like, <laughs> he's a very good North Star and he bats damn close to a thousand. He's very, in, well, especially for his own show. He knows, he knows mm-hmm. what worked. He, from day one, he seemed to have had a, a great vision. Um, but... That's a real um, kind of ex- existence, isn't it? You know, you wake up and you're, and and it's good. I mean, I think we could use more of that apprenticeship, journeyman, mastery, slow slow cooking of of talent, ten thousand hours, you know, Gladwellian idea. Because um, sometimes now people are getting TV shows off of Twitter, and sometimes you think it might benefit from a couple of years in a writer's room or, or working under the tutelage of somebody. Um, who's, you know, just a couple years ahead of you. So I, I really, really benefited from cutting my teeth. Anyway, the reason why I bring that up is because um, that is one way to live, to be in service of somebody else's vision. Um, and then mm-hmm. you get to a point in experience and in age where the studio might say to you, hey, why don't you be the North Star for this show? Hey, why don't you make the decision um, if something's funny? Or you decide if this pitch is is going in or not. Like I said in the last answer, that that is a whole new level of responsibility, power, discomfort, um, and some people flow. Man, some people just have that 
buttery confidence and just this flow upward <laughs> real easy. Totally. <laughs> it doesn't know? matter how much experience they've had. They just, they just have it, you know? They're it's like, incredible. they're kind of like, yeah, no shit. I'm going to be the boss now. You know, like, it's like, it's so <laughs> obvious. I was supposed to be the boss five years ago. I didn't at every stage. I'm like, I was the, I'm the crying baby, right? I'm the one being pulled through to the next level of existence where you're like, and, and you know, you're screaming and <laughs> they have to rip you, rip you through the threshold. Sorry for the graphic metaphor, but like, um, and so, um, and then you get your bearings and, and you, and you decide whether or not, um, they're right to, to, mm. to bestow or bequeath that, that, um, responsibility on you. So what I do, and maybe this comes from acting, I think it definitely comes from acting is there's a quote in, um, a great book called the actor and the target where he says, you can defeat fear by taking hold of its armaments and using it against it or something like that. So essentially, mm. the, the way to defeat fear is by mimicking it. And, and so what fear's doing is fear's applying all these different um, techniques and strategies on you. And so um, rather than be reactive, you should be curious and take a look at what that, you know, sort of dark shadow energy is doing to you and uh, copy it. And so, um, I love that for me, it's anxiety, right? Anxiety is my, is my, the, the monkey on my back. Um, and people have different things. Some people have addictive behavior. Some people shut down. Some people get manic. Some, for me, it's anxiety and it's buzzing. And I feel like sort of insects crawling under my skin. And that kind of like, you wake up one day and there's like this sort of strange person in your room. Let's call him anxiety. And you're like, oh, shit. Hi. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you're, you might run from him for, I'm making it a him. And you might run from him for a couple of years or a couple <laughs> months or a couple of decades. You might try to do drugs to get away from him. You might, um, you know, ignore him, which is a bad idea. Um, and then what happens is, and you might try to kill him. And then I think what happens is um, he just becomes your roommate. <laughs> and, you're like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, you're never leaving. So mm. I'm going to set up a, like a bed for you. And sometimes, you know, you'll fart and you'll fart up the room and, you know, be really annoying. <laughs> Other times we might enjoy a movie together. Um, but what happens, I think, at that point is he becomes your roommate and he becomes on some level like a secret weapon. Um, and so the fear that I experienced, for instance, just to take one uh, example out of the thin air, um, being given American born Chinese as a challenge to adapt um, my first solo project as a creator and a showrunner, um, an incredible IP award winning book, a phenomenal cast that were primed to win Oscars and then did, um, mm -hmm. you know, a Marvel director, a big budget Disney plus show. Um, I had almost no choice but to take um, that fear and put it into the show. Like if I had tried to make the show about anything else, I would have evaporated into, into just fumes. I was so, mm. I was under so much personal sort of pressure and crises that I, the only thing I could do was make the writing of the show a writing about the show. So like, you know, if, if you've seen the show, you know, Wei Chen and Jin, basically everybody in the show is having a conversation about confidence, about, mm. about whether or not you're um, capable or whether or not you're going to be crushed by mm. your own, you know, your own expectations and demons and gods and mm. things like that. And so it allowed me to sort of like fold onto myself like a croissant or something. Like I just was living in that space because it would have been too all consuming. I wouldn't have been able to write about anything else. So thinking about, you know, my own neuroses became the task. And I think that's actually sort of the secret antidote to all of it, which is that you have to find a subject matter and an artistic endeavor that's more powerful than your own neurosis or else your neurosis will win. Wow. It will win, you know? And so, um, or you can make them the same thing. <laughs> you can make your art your neurosis, and then and then you just have one thing in front of you. Um, but 
Does that make sense? I don't know. I think I just talked myself in a perfect pretzel, but like that's. You know, <laughs> that's I right. love it. I love. I love all your analogies. I'm like pretzels, croissants. What else is there? Insects <laughs> under your skin. <laughs> no, but it's it's. I mean, it's really really um, powerful what you're saying because I think what you're, I think what you're really dissecting is like the, the in the levels of comfort that we have within ourselves mm. versus what we have like with our external external selves and what happens like with our work and what we do. Um, mm. You seem to have like such a good understanding of that and, and able to dissect that psychologically. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, the work that comes out. I think for me as a creator as well, like I'm not as confident in certain situations, like maybe a pitch, you know what I mean? And so that can affect maybe how people perceive me or maybe the work itself. Even if I think that the work is really good, I might not present it as like the most confident mm. thing. So I do think like there is actually an influence of what material gets put out there because some people are so confident in the work and they can pitch it like crazy and it might not be the best thing, but it gets mm. out there. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's like this, cycle that can keep on happening and existing um as we are like reckoning with all the different changes that are happening in our culture and people becoming more open to different types of stories mm -hmm. and i think that's a really interesting like sort of contrast actually of what's happening um in our industry it, it also tends to be linked i think right like the ability to pitch mm -hmm. or the ability to advertise something in, in an inverse way, it linked to the ability to execute it. And so, so either you partner mm -hmm. with somebody who's the seller and you're the doer, or you're the seller and they're the doer, or you find a way to change hats, it, you know, because, mm -hmm. because you have to, because you, even though you see all the warts and zits all over your own thing, when you walk into the sales pitch of it, whether it's literally a sales pitch or it's a meeting with a studio or, you know, a director mm -hmm. or, um, you, you have to, you have to represent it in a way that where you're not highlighting the, the warts and the zits, but, um, as an artist, you know, you, you sort of can't take your eye off anything but the warts and the zits of anything you're working on ever. It's all you see all the right. time. And it's what makes you a good artist. And it's what, why you want to, um, you know, you never really finish anything. You just run out of time. But at right. some point, you do have to go in and sell it to a public because um, it's an industry, it's a business, it's a capitalistic society. And and mm -hmm. the way to make more <laughs> art is to sell some of that art. Um, right. So you do have to sort of compartmentalize pieces of your personality. I think once upon a time, maybe it was more sort of siloed. You know, like you could be an artist and then you had an agent and you had a... Um, you had a producer and they took care of those things and you got to, you know, sort of wring hands and, you know, right. do, your, and do your things, do be your crazy. things, right. Yeah. And, be, and, uh, be the weird but, artist. but yeah. that's not the world we're living in now. Right. And the world we're living in no. now is you are a one person executive producer of your own art. From the moment you wake up, you need to be broadcasting, propagating, you know, advertising, selling, distribute, distributing your own art on every platform, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's I remember lot. hearing Amy Adams say, this is years ago in a round, round table, they asked her if there was anything unexpected. And she said in the most concise sort of heartbreaking way, she goes, I didn't know I needed to, be, I was going to have to be a model. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she, cause mm -hmm. all around that same time, they were, instead of like Cindy Crawford and Naomi Campbell, they were putting the actresses on, on covers. Oh, wow. And she was like, I signed up to be an actress. I signed up to be to to show human frailty to so you know to represent the human condition. I didn't know I was going to have to be a model and I was going to have to like watch my weight every day of the year and and wow. that kind of broke my heart cuz I was like, yeah, being an actor is very opposite from being a model. Being a model is knowing your angles, knowing what looks good on you, how to wear something, how to represent the best of a moment to a still camera, being an actress is almost the opposite. It's showing the parts yeah. of your personality and your and your humanity that nobody wants to show, that nobody would put on a cover. And so, you know, I don't know, I'm just using that as an analogy to being an artist in 1965, being, you know, Andy Warhol or mm -hmm. Charles Bukowski or, you know, like 
versus being an artist in 2023 and essentially being your brand, you know, and being like you're a walking Nike swoosh. It's so weird. It's so, you know, so schizophrenic in a way. I find that so fascinating. I'm I'm actually really curious about what you think, you know, in terms of like the internal stuff going on in people. Is there anything for you personally that you felt like really affected you? Like how did you kind of overcome some of your own stuff to, I guess, always kind of get to the next level or continue on, I guess. And I feel like you've been in the industry for a long time and have seen a change. So I'm curious what that was like for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, that there's a, there's a, another podcast about screenwriting um, where they call it lava. And it's that, mm -hmm. you know, that molten kind of tectonic thing, you know, that like that is flowing underneath you and, and it might be different for each person. And it can be, like I said, your rosebud or it can be your white whale, right? It can be sort of your your external ambition that you're chasing. Um, the, the thing for me that I think is maybe a little bit different than a lot of particularly Asian American AAPI people in entertainment that I talked to. I talked to a lot of people for some reason who like went <laughs> to law school or went to medical school and then pivoted right. hard back toward or went to some, you know, were literally like computer engineers for Google and said, no, I want to write for um, BoJack Horseman or something, you know, and they just yeah, like right. <laughs> completely like um, from the moment that teacher tapped me on the shoulder at 13, I never mm. actually seriously considered um, another. There was never a moment that I was really pursuing any other, um, I, including going to college. I knew I was either going to NYU or, or UCLA for theater and get it mm -hmm. going, f finishing college. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to pursue acting and um, trying to la land a solid TV or film role. Um, so I never had any of that animus in me other than um, the moment around my late twenties when I pivoted into writing and I knew that my, my mm. acting business model was not tenable. You know, mm. I was essentially like wondering if somebody somewhere was going to write me something great. It just seems like a bad right. idea. You know, it's not only a bad <laughs> business model it's bad. It's not a good mental health choice, right? Like mm -hmm. writing is another form of self torture, but at least when you wake up every morning as a writer, Today might be the day you crack it. Today might be the day you get that idea. The muse comes to visit you. You fix the broken thing that you've been pounding your head on. Today might be the day. And that agency is within your fingertips. As an actor, if you're not writing or doing anything else, you are just hoping somebody somewhere likes you. And like that is just a bad human life, I think. That's not a, that's not mm -hmm. a good human life, you know, to just hope that somebody likes you. Um, so, but this is kind of an odd sentence, but I think everybody can find their way in through one tiny pigeonhole. So, you know, sometimes when you're trying to do an accent or something, there might be a phrase that, that, that clicks you into that accent, whether it's a Southern accent or a British accent. And it like allows you to speak in that accent because that one sentence, just boom, you're in. And I feel like the same thing can happen with art. Like, mm -hmm you know, you entered through music and, or, and even though you're a director now, but like listening to, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and, in you know, whatever year that was your moment or, or the thriller album or whatever, like, and now you're in and because mm -hmm. it, it like, you know, sort of like defibrillated you or something. Um, <laughs> I do think there was a moment, um, where, uh, my parents were, in, my parents didn't, you know, they didn't have like a really harmonious marriage. Um, there was there was some fighting going on, which is reflected in the show. And, you know, they had a lot of immigrant pressure on them. Mm -hmm. We were essentially house poor. They were, you know, they did everything they could to get my brother and I into solid schools. But that meant, you know, not a lot of self-care. Let's just put it that way. So they were under mm -hmm. a lot of stress and, and it, it reflected in their marriage a lot. And um, I went to go see... Um, a, a school play. This is after, this might have been right around when that teacher tapped me on the shoulder. And I remember thinking, oh, this black box 
where people come and they get really quiet for two hours. You can show any emotion you want in here. This is where you go to like basically wig out. Like this is where in a ritualized way, you know what I mean? Like, cause I didn't, and I didn't have any other space for that. Um, There was a shoe closet in my house that I would go when my parents would fight. And that was the closest thing to this experience of being at a theater. And I was like, Oh, you can come here and you can be super duper emotional. And, um, and so I think that was, that's it. That was like, it was like, I just want to be here all the time. Um, and so that's always been sort of my access point for wanting to stay in the theater. Um, Absolutely. Film sets but to I guess some like, extent feel that way. But but yeah. I guess like as you've been going through it, like did, like after you started already auditioning and, mm-hmm. you know, finding your way through different roles and stuff, like did you ever have any other moments where you felt like maybe someone else had it? easier than you even if you worked just as hard as them or you know not not to bring up like resentment type of stuff but just feeling like please do like, why i think it it's a real easier? conversation yeah i don't yeah. i don't have to a fault i don't have that um germ in me i don't know why i think i should and i'm not saying this no. in a disingenuous <laughs> way i think i should i think i should be more aware of the systemic and macro injustices Um, but I don't ever, ever go there. I take it all in and I just sort of like suck all the poison and just try to metabolize it on my own. And as a form of like, um, self-flagellation or something like I, if I was better, if I worked harder, if I slept less, if I wanted it more, I never, ever think, um, that some crime is being perpetrated against me, even though, it probably has been, and it probably is being to some hmm. extent. I don't know. I don't know why. And I've and I over the years I've encountered more and more people, including really close friends and people that inspire me and people I idolize who's who've incorporated that into their work. into their world yeah. work and worldview and and their animus hmm. and their you know. But I just I think it's um, sort of like selective denial or something for me. <laughs> Um, it's worked for you is what I, I could I could tell, which is I mean, it sounds amazing because you know what? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if it's worked for me. I think I think I absolutely need to complain to the manager a little bit more. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like I I think mm-hmm. there are times to complain to the manager and and you're and because what are you really doing when you when the you're absolutely right and you decide not to complain to the manager? You're just shrinking and you're not doing the thing we're saying about representing for the next person. So <laughs> What were you going to say, Andrew? Oh, this, it's a question that I have is like, if you feel like you're not complaining to the manager and are you, you know, are you turning it inward? Does that then go to, well, I need to do more. I need to work harder if I showed up in these ways. Like, are you putting, are you putting that pressure on yourself? Are you internalizing it? And then does it become a, you know, this is, you know, internal locus of control versus external locus of control where it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's up, it's up to me to make this happen. Um, and, you know, do, does that, does that resonate for you? Do you feel like that's part of your, part of your processing? A hundred percent. And I would love to hear your guys take on this too, because I think there is a qualitative difference between not complaining to the manager because you are, um, you believe in your, in your own agency and your own, uh, uh, efficacy and your own ability and you, and accountability and uh, and not complaining to the manager because you don't want to ruffle any feathers because you don't want people to be mad at you because you think they might kick you out of the room um, and those are very very different things and I would say that more often than the former I have the latter disease mm-hmm. um, and so like I, I I wish I could like sit here and like wholeheartedly say it's because I, I just want to, like you said, take that, lo- would you say, locus of influence I forget, and put it on myself. I totally yeah. get that. And I think that's, that's the beautiful choice. More often than not, over my 20, 25 years in the industry, I have opted to, you know, stay uh, within my own bubble where I feel like, you know, it's okay. I can take a few hits, take a few body blows. I'll, I'll get up, you know, and... and uh, 
I get that. I mean, it makes me think of Hillary Clinton for some reason. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> it makes me think yeah. of like what may, what makes you survive a forty year career in politics as a woman versus what we were asking of you in twenty sixteen, and and mm-hmm. she, you know, if she could have flipped that switch. And it's yeah. hard. It's hard, if, you know, in that debate, if she could have turned around and said, back the fuck up, dude. Like, if she could have, right. then, then, you know, who knows how things could have, the cookie could have crumbled. But um, so anyway, that's mm. the disease I have. I don't think younger people have it as much. They have different no, diseases. No, I don't. I think Gen Z is so much more, uh, they just say what they want. You know what I mean? But they have they have a lot of other, other interesting um Things going on. Yeah, too, their their <laughs> crisis, if I may, this may come off <laughs> a- ageist, but I think their crisis, in a nutshell, is they have a choice. You, you, those of us, I don't know how old you are, Andrew, but I'm assuming you're not 22. Um, that that they have a choice based on your based on your resume. I hope you're not 22 because you've done way too much. <laughs> but um, they have a, they have a uh, a fork in the road daily that I don't think any of us had which is no. they have to yeah. choose between having a life and pretending to have a life. And mm. I think that's really tempting. And mm. I think they, they choose the latter too often, if I can just generalize. Because mm-hmm. um, to get back to the point about pitching and selling, um, they can distribute and, prop- and propagate the idea that they're living this rich life, or they can actually live a rich life, but there's just not enough time in the day to do both. So... Um, they do more of the latter and not enough of the former. That's my right. that's my super hot take on <laughs> Gen, y, Gen Z. It, it's also it just means that you're old, Colin. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm joking. I'm joking. In, yeah, in my day. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. Like, this was so, so informative and inspiring. And like, you've given me so much to think about, actually. There's just so many different nuances and like levels and complexities to like all of this, right? I could dive into every little subtopic even further, but um, but we do have to get to the end of our show. So um, I do want to ask you one last question, which is concerning like the topic of internal obstacles what do you feel are solutions and ideas for change? Like when it's something that we can't really see, but we have people who are, you know, in different groups, whether they're in the LGBTQ T plus community or, um, you know, a minority or a person with disability, like these people have obstacles that like people don't really fully understand on the outside. Right. right? So, I guess in that sense, what are things that we could do, whether they're people who are in the hiring position or just executives or even people that are on the ground? I think one thing that you can do is make an, make an internal obstacle an external obstacle, right? So say it, like to, to, to our point about, about um, complaining to the manager. I think, I think also right now it's, it's a little easier sometimes to sort of a I don't know what the word excoriate than to educate. And like, I think that, um, I, I would, I would love to be educated. So, you know, if, if somebody, let's say we had a disabled person working for the show, um, if they were to pull me aside and say, I'd love to just tell you what I, what I go through. Um, I think it would be beneficial. And then, and then I think you can have that conversation open. Um, but, people in positions of power, they might not be prone to sort of like facilitate that discussion without some prodding. So I'm an out loud thinker. So um, I think a lot of outward talking does actually start to make a difference. But in terms of the internal obstacles of people that are marginalized or, you know, historically or whatever, um, I don't know. For me, I don't think that, I don't think they're your that there's something to scrub away or something to get rid of. I think there's something to sort of harness yeah. and mm. to um, embrace in a way. So the last thing I think is that for people to just run toward comfort, um, I think we should all sort of find the benefits and the fossil fuels of our discomfort and see what, you know, what stories are there because that's the good stuff. That's the stuff nobody's, no stories nobody's have told. So. Yeah. The fossil fuels of our discomfort. 
bro, that's a bar. That's a bar. <laughs> no, because it's, it's, I, I think, I think to what we were talking about earlier, it's, it's, it's this idea of those things that we have been taught are our weaknesses. Is there a way to convert them to be our strengths? And so if you yeah. have been in the position where, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I think about, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, has the idea of double consciousness. And he particularly applied it, you know, mm. to black Americans. But I think it, you know, applies to whatever your otherness may be. I think when it comes to storytellers, double or triple or quadruple consciousness, it makes you a better storyteller. Because if I have had to move through spaces my entire life, knowing the truth of who I am, but understanding that to other people, I am a character based upon what they perceive of me. So they see me as a young black man and they say, okay, I'm assuming this, this, and this about you. You move through these spaces. This is what you're coming here for. And so I'm having to navigate not only with my own truth and who I actually am, but also in navigating around and with who other people perceive me as. And I have to do that for not only just comfort, but also personal safety. So if I am dealing with the police, for instance, I'm having to adjust my movements, I'm having to adjust my body language, I'm having to adjust my tone. And so I think in those ways, that's, that's what I hear you saying in some ways, is like the fossil fuels of our discomfort, like those ways in which we have been taught to minimize, that we have been taught to make ourselves smaller, to shrink, to try to become invisible or not stick out. Those might be the cores of actually what will allow us to show ourselves fully to show up authentically and to separate ourselves out from everyone else who hasn't had to navigate or think about the world in that way. Right. You, I mean, that, that you, you can convert that energy into something that could move an aircraft carrier. That is unconverted energy. You just have to, you know, it might look like sticky tar or whatever, but that is so, it's all there and it's all seeping through all of, you know, all of your veins. And like, how do you bring that out? And you can just power a whole city. You know, mm -hmm. but you have to sort of find and that's where craft and technique come in. And but um, I love everything you just said. It's so it's so true that um, David Foster Wallace has a quote that good writing is the intersection of personal interest in public entertainment. And, you know, what he's saying is it's interesting to me and I'm going to show you why it's interesting to you. And it's not, you know, too many writers think if it's interesting to me, I'm done. Right. You're like, no, you're not done. <laughs> the whole point is now you got to convert it into a form where, and so that's kind of the double consciousness to what you're saying. It's like being aware of your personal interests, but also the public interest and the public entertainment. And so the people that are good at what we want to do in terms of storytelling are the people that show you the link between what's interesting to you and what's unique about you and what's entertaining to a public. And that's hard, but if you can do it, you can, you know, you can change the whole world. So um, that's what we're trying to do every day when we wake up. Wow. <laughs> you guys, I did not expect to be so inspired today. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I could, I could keep on talking about this. I really could. Like, this is just like the stuff. You of didn't life, expect you know? it. You were like, this is gonna be fine. <laughs> we're yeah. Gonna... <laughs> yeah, we're just. I mean, I guess expected to just talk a little bit more honestly about like more of the nuances of the industry. But like, this is like deep stuff that I think people in general, like artists, will, will really take. You know. Um, I read a lot of, I listen to a lot of writers and, and podcasts about, yeah, just like writing and, and internal struggles and like their journey into writing and like the fears and anxiety. And you named mm -hmm. that thing, like you said that you name anxiety and like you give him a bed, right? So like, and I've heard that too, like a self, um, there's like a, a life coach once said, uh, like she names the fear her gremlin <laughs> and she acknowledges mm -hmm. it and she talks mm -hmm. to it every day and she like faces it, you know? And I think mm -hmm. the thing is yeah. we're always going to have fear. We're always going to have things that we're not comfortable with. And the harder part is to actually acknowledge and like realize it's there. And I think that's something I'm as a person who works in the industry, who cares a lot about what I do, my craft and all that stuff. Like, have to face every single day of my life and I think a lot of people do that and I think it's um I think these lessons that you guys spoke about today are things that people can definitely take in as they go in their personal journeys so thank you <laughs> yeah. Calvin thank you very yeah. much
appreciate thank you, you guys i'm such a such a fan and uh and i'm glad to know more about the mission now and i'm gonna go down a deep rabbit hole and find out everything i can please do All right, so this is the end of the podcast. And just for everyone listening out there, this is Film Philosophy. Our website is filmphilosophy.com. That's film and then philosophy with an F dot com. You can find educational resources on there, bonus episodes. You can also email us at filmphilosophy.tme at gmail.com. And we encourage that you can send us some audio messages by email. If you have any questions or thoughts or suggestions, so we can play it back on our podcast. And it's okay if you also don't want to do that. You can also just send us a regular old-fashioned email. And thank you everyone again for listening. We had so much fun and insight and inspiration from this topic that we also kept talking after we wrapped the episode. So please enjoy some bonus content from our chat. You can find it on our website, filmphilosophy.com. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone.